All right, good morning, everyone. And good morning to our online students as well. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. All right, so today we're going to be uh, doing the other course that has been assigned to me, which is uh, our identity, right? And uh, uh, the course notes are available on Google Classroom, so uh, on the stream. So if you'd like, you can. Again, just download them and track along even as we are studying. And uh, throughout this course, uh, we'll be talking about our identity in Christ. Right Now, our identity is very important. Right? Yes, we have a natural identity. Right? Our natural identity is who we are. Uh, we are Indian. We are from a certain place, certain culture. But what is our identity? in Christ Jesus. Right? So that is what we're going to be talking about. And we have about 13 sections. Uh, this entire course is uh, broken up into 13 sections. So uh, we will go through it uh, one by one, each section at a time, and uh, see uh, as much as we can cover. Also, uh, again, if you have questions, and you can feel free to just raise your hands, ask questions. Those who are online, you can post your questions. You can unmute. Uh, so don't don't uh, you know stop yourself from asking questions, right? It's always good to ask. If you don't understand something, you want me to repeat something, it's fine, right? Uh, but I, but it'll be good to learn together, right? Uh, hopefully, the notes for us will be available by next week, and then you can. So for today, uh, let's get into the introduction on our identity, right? Now, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when we say identity? Right? Uh, many things, right? Many of us may think of many things. Right? Some of us may say, OK, I'm a doctor. I'm an engineer. I'm a student. I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a teacher. Sometimes we identify ourselves with what we do. right? Or I am from this state. Uh, I am from this background. Or sometimes it's the language that we speak. I'm a, I'm a Hindi speaking. I'm a Marathi speaking. I'm an English speaking, Kannada speaking. Right. So we, we can base our identity, our natural identity, on many things. Right. Uh, it can be gender specific. It can be for a girl or for a boy. But we can, you know, very easily identity. Our identity is very easy easily said right? but the Lord Jesus in, in all through the scriptures we see that the Lord Jesus calls us his children right? he says I am the shepherd you are the sheep right? and in many places the in the Old Testament all through the Old Testament he says you are my children I will never leave you I will never forsake you so after the cross, when you and I have become believers, what is our new identity? Now, let me give you this um, illustration. Picture this young boy, right? He's living in the slums. He's living in the slums. He's used to this rough life, right? But a rich man comes along and says, OK, I am going to adopt this boy. He has no parents. He has nobody. He's been living in the slums. Right? So the rich man says, I will adopt this boy. So he takes this boy, takes him to his big house, a big mansion, in his, and keeps him there. Now, two things can happen. One, this young boy can continue to act as if he's living in the slum, or he can continue, he can change his identity and Look at himself as, hey, now I cannot act like that. I cannot act like how I used to act or behave when I was in, in the slum. Why? Because his identity has changed. Right? At the time he was in the slum, running around, doing all wrong things, right? living a very dirty life. But now when he's come to this rich man's house, he has to learn. He has to learn how to live. Maybe he has to learn how to sit on a table and eat his food, learn how to dress well, learn how to talk politely, 
And this is what happened for you and I. As believers, we were in sin. We were in bondage. The devil was holding us captive. But after the cross, when we believe in Jesus, right? let's read 2 Corinthians 5.17. Let's read that verse. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Go ahead. Anybody can read. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have come become new. Yeah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. Now this work, this verse talks about creation, right? God created us in a certain way. He created Adam and Eve, but because of sin, they fell. But now he's saying, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, right? We have a new identity. Right? Now, doesn't mean that we you know we get wings and start flying doesn't mean that we'll you know suddenly everyone will say oh you're very good no right doesn't mean we will you know look very gracious we may look the same right? nothing in our physical appearance may change right but in our inner being in our spirit we are a new creation old things have passed away right all the apostle says, I, uh, uh, no, sin, I am dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. Because he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Uh, even if temptation comes, I'm dead to it. Because I'm a new creation. Right? Let me give you this uh, another example. Picture this alcoholic, right? Somebody who is always drinking, 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 drinking. And... This person has passed away. He has died. And he's there on the deathbed. Imagine you take the best alcohol bottles, right? best in the world, and you keep it next to him. He's never even seen this in his life. The best alcohol in the world. We keep it next to him. Will he drink it? Will he be able to drink? Why? He's dead. So it's not going to affect him. You get the best, whether it's the most expensive, it doesn't affect because he's dead. So the same way, when the enemy brings temptation, when sin comes our way, as God's children, we are dead to sin. Of course, we have to fight that battle, right? God has completed the work and he invites each one of us to live out of that, right? So one of the most amazing revelations in the New Testament is that, now let me give you a picture. The notes are not available on the screen. Uh, it's not? Okay. Uh, it's there on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Daniel, uh, the notes are on the stream. So just if you go down a little bit, you'll see the notes there. Okay, uh, page nine, God has completed the work and he invites us to live out of it. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross, what did he do? He broke the veil that was separating between God and man. Okay, now I'm going to paint a picture for you. Right? Everyone has a have an imagination, right? So I'm going to paint a picture for you. Now, in the Old Testament, remember the high priest? He can go only once into the Holy of Holies. Only once. Once a year. Why? Because that was a holy place. If he has not repented for his sins, he will die. Right? There was separation between God and man. Why? Because of sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? That veil was 
throne. So the separation was no more there. In the Old Testament, people did not have this intimacy, this relationship with God like how you and I have. The Holy Spirit would come and go. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit resides in us. Right? So the greatest, the most amazing work that the Lord Jesus did on the cross is he invited us into his presence. Right? God has done such a great work that when we are born again, we are born again by his grace. In the Old Testament, you have to cut the bull, you have to cut a goat, you have to take that goat, you have to take the blood, you have to go to the temple and then offer the sacrifice. That is pain offering, guilt offering, sin offering, all kinds of offering. But now, in the New Testament, after Jesus died on the cross, he's inviting all of us. We don't have to take a bull or a goat and go into his presence. We can go by grace. Amen? We don't have to be afraid and go like what happened in the Old Testament. The people used to be afraid. The Israelites would be afraid. Oh, what if God does not forgive me? What if God is angry with me? But in the New Testament, we go with boldness. Why? Because it's not our works. It's the grace of God. So how, is, how important it is for you and I to understand this? Many times we want to pray. We sit to pray. What happens? The devil will come. Ah, you did this mistake. He'll make a list. One, two, three, four, five mistakes you have made, and now you want to pray. And what do we feel? We feel guilty. Oh, I did so many things wrong. Will God answer me? What does it say? We are not going by our own works. We are going by the blood of Jesus. So it is grace. We don't have to put up a show. We don't have to become somebody else to go into God's presence. We can go. Just the way we are. Is it good or is it bad? Is it, is it a good thing? Is it, is it good that we can go into his presence just by God's grace? Right? We don't have to read the whole Bible a hundred times and say, okay, God, I read, I read the whole Bible. I, we don't have to say I finished my PTH, DTH, all of that is important. But we're not going with a certificate. We're going by grace. Not our works, but his grace. So our identity is changed. Who you are because of whose you are. Let me repeat that, right? Whoever you are, it is because of whose you are. Remember the example of the orphan boy? Right? When he's living in the slum, he'll behave like somebody who's living in the slum. May speak bad language, may dress up the wrong way, he may he may not talk politely. He's behaving like that. That's not his fault. He doesn't know. But when he comes to this rich man's house, what happens? Everything changes. The way he talks, the way he dresses up, his manners, everything changes. So you and I, as children of God, we must understand that we are God's children and we are identifying with who he is. So how much we should live a life, right? That is honorable to him. We need to know our identity and our inheritance in Christ and live that out. Who you are in Christ is who you really are. I'm going to repeat this. Who you are in Christ is who you really are. So each one of us, our identity is not, yes, we have a natural identity. Right? We may be from a city. We may be from a town. We may be from a village. We may be able to speak Hindi. We may be able to speak English. All of that is in the natural. 
but who you really are your inside being who you really are is who you are in Christ that's who you are you are saved you are healed you are delivered you are redeemed you are God's child you belong to God's kingdom you are saved by the blood of Jesus God calls you he says in Ephesians chapter 1 he says you are seated with me in heavenly places so right now you're seated in APC Bible College, online students may be seated at home or wherever. But in the spiritual realm, we are seated with him, with Jesus in heavenly places. So when the devil looks at us, he's not looking at us as, oh, these people, nothing. No, he knows these are believers. They believe in Jesus. He knows the power that we have. Now, he knows the power. We know the power that we have. But the thing is, we must be willing to use that power. Right? That's when we live out of our identity in Christ. So how will this identity in Christ change our way of living? Right? How will this truth change the way of living? Will it change or no? Right? It will change. Now, the, now, before becoming believers, we may have been fearful, we have been doubtful, we may feel like, hey, I'm not good enough. But after becoming believers, suddenly the fear is gone. No fear. Maybe before, you know, we were feeling depressed, getting angry every time, pride or jealousy, right? Or the lust of the flesh. But after becoming believers, everything is gone. We don't feel all of these urges. Why? Because it changes the way we look at life. As believers, it changes. So how will this change? One, it will change our self-image, right? Our self-image. What we think about ourselves. Sometimes you may think, oh, I don't know anything. I don't know, a, I don't know how to sing. I don't know any instruments. I'm not good in studies. You may think of all these things. But when we know who we are in Christ, when we know who, uh, what our identity is, it will change the way we think. Right? Suddenly we'll say, we'll be, hey, I'm God's child. I don't know how to sing. I don't know how to play instrument. I don't know how to uh, you know, do well in uh, my studies, whatever. All of that is there, but still I'm God's child. So the way you look at yourself is different. Amen? Right? All of a sudden, it'll change. Nobody has to tell you, hey, you are God's child. You know it. It's there inside you. Right? And you'll be able to walk with that identity. Walk in boldness. Two, it will change the way you relate to God. Now, as God's children, in, in the Old Testament, as we said, people were fearful to go to God. But now, as believers, you know that he's your father, he loves you. So the way you relate to him will change. Right? Let me give you an example. In the natural, right, a, a father or parents. So, for example, the, a, a son or a daughter says, I want a cycle. Okay? And the parents will say, not now, next year. Right. Does it does it mean that the parents don't love the children? Parents still love the children. But not the right time right now. Right. Now, for example, uh, you know, you know, uh, a son does something wrong. A child does something wrong. Right. Now, he's scared to go tell his father, but he knows he has to go and tell. So he goes and he tells his father. His father gets upset and says. See, this is your punishment. Next two months, you can't go out to play. Now, will the son run away or will he come back home? He will come back home. Because he knows that's my house. And he knows, even though my parents may be strict, they're correcting me. My parents love me. The same way, when we relate to God, right? God is not somebody who is, you know, a magician. 
oh, whatever we ask, you know, it just happen. No, that's not how God works. God has a way in which He works, but the way we relate to God will change. We call Him, He's my Father. He's my Helper. God loves me. I know that you know we may be going through a difficult situation or a difficult season in our life. We can still say, I know that God loves me. So what am I doing? The way I relate to God has changed. Now, if you look at people who are, you know, people who don't know about the Lord Jesus, the way they relate to God is different. Sometimes there are people who don't believe in God. They relate to themselves. They feel that they are right always. But you and I, as God's children, changes the way we relate to Him. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to feel condemned. Right? We don't have to feel uh, like, okay, God is not going to listen to my prayers. What We don't have to feel, you know, sometimes we feel I, we do the same sin again and again and again. And then we go back and we say, God, Sorry, sorry, once more it's happened like this. So sorry, I shouldn't have done this. You don't have to feel that way. You can go back to God with a humble heart, and He is a God who loves us. He is a God who forgives us. So the way we relate to Him changes, right? It will change the way we face our challenges and difficulties in life. So if you see a difficult situation, Say, you see a big mountain in front of you. When I say mountain, I mean a difficult situation. You can declare God's word. Hey, God is bigger than this situation. The God that I serve, who's my father, is bigger than this. So he gives us the boldness. Now, God does not say, I will not bring troubles. God does not say there will not be any challenges or difficulties. That will be there. Right? How many of you have not gone through any difficulty, no challenges in life? Everything was nice. From the time you were a youth till now, everything is right. Anyone is there? Everyone has their problems. But the way we look at that problem is will change because we are God's children. Let me give you an example. There's a believer, there's an unbeliever. Right? Exams have come in. Say it's a 10 standard board exam, an important exam. Right? Now, this boy one say, oh man, 10 standard board exam. I'm fearful. I don't know what I'll write. You know, what if I fail? What if I don't do well? What about my future? Where will I get a job? You know, he's thinking about all those things. And fear is settling in. A believer, he will also have that feeling. Oh man, 10 standard exam. I have to do well. But when fear comes, what will a believer do? And say, hey, I don't have the spirit of fear. God is with me. I will do my best. I'll prepare. I'll study. God will help me to do well. So there's freedom. Same situation. Both are facing the same mountain. But the way they look at the mountain is very different. Understood? Right? So like that, there'll be many situations. Oh, who will provide for me? When will I, you know... Uh, Pay my fees. When will I do this? When will I grow up? When will? But here, a believer say, "Hey, God is with me. God will help me." Same situation, two different views. So, as believers, the way we look at life will change. It will change, and you will notice it, right? Because when we were unbelievers, we are thinking of all the worldly things. Oh, every time I want to do this, this is. Suddenly, become believers. Everyone are uh, you know your friends and your family is thinking, hey, how this boy became so good? You know, how is he getting up? You know, he's praying. He's not using bad words. He's he's uh, you know reading his Bible. He's being so polite. What is this change? People will notice, right? It will change the way you face demons and demonic powers right now the devil is there devil has things that he is doing devil is not going to say okay now you become believer so i will not disturb you no right devil will say this fellow has become believer i need to trouble him even more right? 
What does the Bible say? The devil is like a roaring lion trying to devour. It also says that he's an accuser. Right? Um, Ephesians chapter 6 says uh, he, you know, he has fiery darts that he, you know, he these bow and arrows like darts, he aims it at us so that we get discouraged, so that we may fail. But the way we look at demons, the way we look at demonic powers will change as believers. So for example, you and I are believers now. All of us are believers, right? We have this Holy Spirit inside us. Somebody, when you, you know, you're maybe somebody, you're going for a meeting, prayer meeting, and there's somebody, somebody who's possessed by a demon. How will we relate to that? Will we get fearful and run away? Or will we say, hey, I know who's inside me. I know who's that, right? You know, uh, when I was very young, I started to travel to many places all across North India, many, many places. So we used to do these conferences and pastors' meetings. I was very young, maybe 20, 21 years old. And during all I knew, I, I didn't know too much, but I knew that the Holy Spirit is there with me. And so there was this couple of times when you know, we were teaching and preaching and all of that. And people who were demon possessed will come and stand. I used to get scared because I was I was very young, right? I didn't understand. So many times I I would, I would get that fear, but then I thank God because the Holy Spirit strengthens us. Right? So there was one time this person came, stood, started shouting and getting angry. He came to hit. And at that moment, I said, Lord Jesus, please help me. I need your strength. I can't do this alone. I remember suddenly, like as if, you know, uh, as if I have one, uh, two lions next to me, like a boldness. If anything comes, these lions will attack. I felt like a boldness. I said, you can't do anything. Inside the fear was little was there. I said, you can't do anything. You cannot even touch me. And it is true. He, that, that person couldn't even come close. Couldn't come close. He said, you can't touch me. You cannot do anything. You're, you're a defeated. You're already defeated. On the cross, Jesus crushed your head. You're a defeated foe. So, so you cannot do anything to me because the Holy Spirit is inside me. And that day, that demon just went. I didn't even have to pray. I said, in Jesus' name, get out. Gone. That day I realized the way we look at demonic forces, demonic uh, things that the enemy is doing will change when we know our identity. We should know our identity. If we still feel, okay, I am like a small boy, I don't know anything, you know, I still have to read, the, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If we feel that way, that's what will happen. Who you are in Christ is who you really are. So if you know your identity, the devil will know that. Right? Then, last one, it will change the way you relate to people, very important. As believers, it'll change the way that you relate to people. They could be believers, they could be unbelievers. Right? In Christ, we are brothers and sisters. Yes? Right? And why do we call each other brother, I brother, I sister? Why do we do that? Are they really your brother and sister? No, right? But the way we relate to people changes. We begin to love people. We begin to care for them, help them, support them. And, and, and when we look at people who are being, uh, you know, even unbelievers, we look at them and say, hey, I wish I can tell them about Jesus, or I wish they can get to know about Jesus. Suddenly there's, there's love, there's care, there's affection, which was not there before. How did it happen? Because of the Holy Spirit inside us. Remember, you'll also learn about the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the most important, is 
uh, what does Paul say? He says, you can have all the gifts, 1 Corinthians 13, you can have all the gifts, but if you do not have love, you're nothing. So as believers, the way we relate to people changes. Amen? The way we relate to people. Uh, boys are staying with the boys. You know, relate to each other, knowing that you are believers in Christ. Relate to one another. And then you will go back to your hometowns. Relate to people as believers. Right? I remember saying this story once. This happened to me really. I was I was traveling to a certain place in Bangalore, and as I was traveling, uh, uh, I saw one person. One person was driving the car, and on the car there was a sticker: "Jesus loves you." Big sticker, right? So he was going, and after some time, I saw that there was a small accident that happened, and the whole traffic was stopped. And I saw this man in the car. He got out, and he's using all kinds of bad language. Saying, you are this, or you did this, or shouting at him. Went to hit him in abusive language. I thought to myself, what is this? He's written, Jesus loves you, but he is not loving anybody. He's only put that sticker there, Jesus loves you. So I went to him and I told him, please remove that sticker from your car. First thing. He said, why? I'm a Christian. I said, doesn't look like it. It's not like this person did a big mistake that you have to go hit him. Okay, it was a small mistake. Let's move on. Sometimes we we take things for granted. We say we are believers, but we don't behave like that. That's not right. We must, who we are, we should relate it in our life. Right? Just like Jesus, uh, each one of us, God wants us to walk in that kind of identity. How did Jesus walk? He walked in love. He walked in power. He walked in authority. He healed people. He forgave. That's how he wants us to walk. Right? So let's read John chapter 14, verse 19 to 20. John chapter 14, 19 and 20. A little while longer, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Right. So here the Lord Jesus is foretelling his disciples that a time will come when they will receive revelation of who God, the Lord Jesus is. Right. Uh, that through the church, he says, uh, verse 20, he says, at that day, you will know that I am in the father and the father is in me. So what is Jesus saying? He's foretelling the, to the disciples. He's saying, just like how. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. One day, when I finish my work, when I finish the cross, when I go up to heaven, same way, one day you will be in me. He goes on, you know, in the same chapter in verse, uh, John chapter 15, in that next passage, he says, I am the vine. If you remain in me, abide in me, and you, ab and I, and you abide in me, then you will bear fruit, right? Let's read. The vine and the branches, John chapter 15, verse 1 through 5. John 15, 1 through 5. Go ahead, read. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he pounds, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot be bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, 
and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Yeah. So the Lord Jesus is using this illustration of the vine and the branches. Now, how many of you have seen uh, okay, uh, the, the vineyard? How many of you have seen a vineyard, the vine and the branches? Seen it? Okay. Let, okay. Let's take a regular, uh, a normal plant, right? Now, you've got the main stem. From the seed, the main stem comes. And then you've got the branches. Now, Jesus is saying, I am the vine. That is, I am that center portion. And you are the branches. Now, for example, if we put a seed, an apple seed, what will come from that? Apple will come. Oranges won't come. If oranges come, then something is wrong. Right? You put an apple seed, apple will come. Now, the same way, when we are, the Lord Jesus is the vine, we are his branches. So our, if we are part of him, what should flow out of us? Part of Jesus. His life should flow in and through us. Because he's the vine, we are the branches. Right? And it says here, we are connected to him spiritually and we are spiritually one with him just as the branch is one with the stem. Now what happens if you go out, you take a plant and then you break the branch off? What will happen? Can you take that branch and go plant it somewhere? Will it, will it grow? It's disconnected. It's not connected anymore. It is not going to bear fruit. But if you connect it, if you're connected to the to the stem, only then you will bear fruit. So Jesus is using this example. He's saying, if you and I want to bear fruit, we need to abide in him. We need to rest in him. Right? Now, how many of you want to start your own ministry? You want to become pastor, you want to become evangelist, or you want to start your own ministry. How many of you? Yeah, those online also can uh, share. I mean, if you want to start your own ministry, you want to be a pastor, one, two, pastor, evangelist, yes. Andrew, uh, yeah, Mercy, yes. So many of us, right? Now, what is the most important thing? If you want to start your own ministry as believers, what, what must we do? Get the certificate. Remain in him. Only if you remain in him, abide in him, you will bear fruit. Otherwise, you will not bear fruit. Then he goes on in that same verse. He says uh, about fruit, your work, we shall be known by our fruit, what we do. That's what we'll be known by. If we are part of a branch or we are part of a seed, where there's only corruption, there's anger, there's jealousy, pride. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to be. But if we are part of Jesus, if he is the vine and we are the branches, what overflows from us is his life. Right? And we will be fruitful. That's what it is. Very simple. I always tell myself, am I bearing fruit? You should, we should ask ourselves, right? am I bearing fruit in what I am doing? If I am not bearing fruit, something is wrong. You shall be known by your fruit. Now, I want to give you this example as well. You put a seed in the ground and you water it. Next day when you come, apple won't be there. Right? There's some work you have to do. Right? You have to make sure that you water it, make sure that... No, it's looked after well, and over time, the fruit will come. So don't sow the seed and say, God, where's the fruit? Wait for some time. Plan, prepare, work, live a holy life. The right time, the fruit will come. But if you're not abiding in him, you will, you will not see fruit. Right? So very important, especially those who are pastors, those God who has called you for, you know, for ministry, very, very, very important to stay in his presence, to abide in him. 
because we can get busy doing many things. I want to start prayer group, I want to start cell group, I want to start women's fellowship, children's ministry, all that is good. But where is the seed? Where is the root? It is in abiding in Him. Only then we'll be fruitful. Amen? Right? So always remember that. What's in Him is in us. The life of Christ is in each one of us. We are fruit-bearing because we manifest Christ's life. Let's read uh, the next portion. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. Let's read that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. It's a long passage, but let's read that. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made the, to bound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispension of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in, on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchase, possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thank you, Gertrude. Right. Thank so in these 14 verses, the Apostle Paul is talking about being in Christ 10 times. 10 times. Look at verse 4 before we go to those 10 verses. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Can you believe that? Now, the cross is not, you know, a plan B. It was not like uh, God was, uh, now he didn't know what to do. Oh, Adam, I told you, don't eat the fruit. You ate the fruit. Now, what to do now? No, 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 no. It's not a plan B. What does it say? God has chosen each one of us before the foundation of the world. Before Genesis chapter 1, God has chosen us to be in him. Can you imagine that? Before God said, let there be light. Before he said, he, he, you know, he made the heavens before the foundations of the world. He has called you and me to be in him. He has already decided it long back. Now, what is it that we have when we are in Christ Jesus? Here, let's just look at that list. Verse 3. We are blessed. Verse 4, chosen. We are holy, sanctified, set apart. What is sanctified? Made holy. Right? Next one, we are blameless without fault and righteous. Blameless. So when we go to God's presence, the Lord, just imagine this. We are, the Father is seated, seated there. You got the Lord Jesus standing next to the, seated on the right hand of the Father. And we are going, 
We're standing there. Now, when God sees us. He does not see us. You know, we may have many sins inside us. But when God sees us, he sees us through his son, Jesus Christ. So you see, it's like Jesus will remind the father, Father, I died for this boy. I died for this person. I shed my blood for him. The father will say, I forgive you. Right? We are blameless. We are covered in love. Verse 4. And we are loved by the Father. Verse 5. We are predestined according to his purpose. That means God has called us and he has destined us to have all these blessings in Christ Jesus. He's saying it is yours. You don't have to work for it. All you have to do is believe in faith. Then, verse 5, we are adopted as his children. So we have an earthly parents, father, mother, yes. But we are adopted as his children. Whose love is greater, our parents' love or God's love? It's love. He says, even if your mother and father forsake you, I will not forsake you. Right? He says, I've written your name in the palm of my hand. Never forget you. Your parents, your, your loved ones might forsake you. I will never do that. That's what we have in him. We are people of his praise displaying his glory. Verse 6, we are accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, they are redeemed. We are forgiven. Verse 8, we are recipients of his abounding, overflowing grace. Verse 10, we are gathered as one in Christ. Verse 11, we're given an inheritance. What is our inheritance? We may ask ourselves, I don't have any inheritance. Right? My parents are from a poor background or I, I, I don't have anything. It does not matter. Your inheritance is not here on earth. Your inheritance is in heaven. What is it? You will be called all of this, saved. We made the declaration this morning, right? You're saved, healed, delivered, redeemed, blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. And all of these things are there, available for you and me. We must walk in it, right? Then he says, we are uh, seated, sorry, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit and we have been purchased by a price. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is inside us, right? Uh, what does sealing means? It is to make a, a mark to identify, okay, this is mine. You know, this word seal has come, especially if you look at, you know, people who own cattle and farm, right? They they put a seal on their on their livestock, right? Okay, this is so wherever they go, they'll know, okay, this is this person is the owner. Like that, God has us put a seal over each one of us. And that seal is the seal of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not like somebody has put on seal and said, HS, Holy Spirit. No. It is an eternal seal. It is a stamp inside us. So when the devil sees us, he sees that seal. Oh, the Holy Spirit is there. He knows. When the Lord Jesus sees, he knows the Holy Spirit is there. When people see, they will know there's a seal. There's a seal. He's somebody else. He's God's child. He's, he's not going to do what everyone else are doing. He belongs to another person. That's the seal that we carry. And finally, we are purchased by the blood of Jesus. We are purchased. It is not like Jesus came and told the devil, had a one-hour discussion. Can can I take these people if you if I can? You take uh, seventy percent. I'll take thirty percent. No. What did Jesus do on the cross? He said three things, three words. It is finished. That means what? I've completed the work. I've defeated the devil. All you have to do is believe. Right, so we'll stop here, uh, and then we'll pick up from the next class. Right, uh, let's just quickly close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for teaching us. 
uh, our identity in you, Lord. And help us, Lord, as your children to walk in your identity. We thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our online students as well. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, thank you. God bless.